who are living in a scientific world like never before, and students have to understand how it affects their daily life. Things that they did every day, I would explain to them why, how. And when you come in the first day, they are so far from you. And um, that first day is so important, though. If you get them the first day, you got them. They would come into my class and they would say, we are going to hate this science class. There is no way we're going to like science. The chip was on this shoulder and one on that shoulder. And then after a little bit, the students, some of them would say to me, you know, I can't believe I'm loving this class. My family is um, a religious Orthodox family. In Portland, Maine, while there were 5,000 Jewish people in the city, they were mostly conservative and reform. There were about 100,000 people in the whole city. There were really very few Orthodox people. There was no chance for real Orthodox upbringing. Uh, not so much upbringing, because that you can do internally in a home. But there were no schools. There, were no, there was what they called Talmud Torahs, an uh, elementary school, uh, where you went to high school and went there after school a little bit. But you had no real training. The only place where you could get real training in, in real Jewish education was to come to New York. And Yeshiva University, since I was ready to go to college at that time, um, was where I came. My history at the Fashion Institute of Technology starts in 1956 when I was teaching for the New York City Board of Education at the Bronx High School of Science and I was looking for a part-time job to fill in somewhat. I was flipping through the yellow pages when I saw an ad by a school called the Fashion Institute of Technology. Never heard of it, but they wanted what I wanted, so I called them up. They offered me an afternoon job teaching science and all mathematics, and I accepted. The whole FIT was in the High School of Fashion Industries, which was on 24th Street. We had, I remember, the entire eighth floor. That was FIT. Uh, our office was a small, little, narrow room. In fact, it was so narrow that if someone wanted to get by me, I had to stand up and move my chair for them to get by. Now, there were about 200 students, not even, at the school, and there were about a dozen faculty members. When we were ready to move into the C building out of this crowded little floor, and the um, we and all 200 students, as I say, there was a band, and there was the governor was there, and the mayor was there, and uh, all kind of big shots from all over the city and state because it was such an unusual situation. We were sure that this building would last us for years and years and we would never have a problem. Literally, the day we walked in, we had so many applications that the building was too small. When I came to FIT and for quite a few years afterwards, it was a um, very close-knit community. Uh, there wasn't one faculty member that I didn't know by name, and especially since I did the college program, and they all knew me by name. The student body, all 200, I would say I knew just about every one of them. And since only I and a gentleman named William Leder taught the only science courses, he primarily taught the biological science, and I taught the physical science. So I really just about taught every student in the school. There used to be a hotel up in the Catskills, which doesn't exist anymore, called Grossinger's. You know Grossinger's? Fine. We arranged with Grossinger's, which wasn't filled before Christmas or before New Year's, they were kind of empty, to come up there with about, oh, I don't know, maybe a hundred students and uh, half a dozen faculty members as chaperones. And um, the kids would go up for three days, two nights, three meals a day, ice skating, skiing, you name it. You know what they paid? $25. Faculty went free. The students in those days came primarily from New York City. We had no dormitories. We had that one floor, and uh, there were some students maybe from New Jersey. There were no, almost no students from out of the country or out of the state. Some, but not many. The difference between students then and students now, frankly, was not great. They were 
I always said they were sweet, likable, nice kids. And um, today there are many more uh, students from outside the state, from outside the country. We have dormitory students, which we didn't have in those days. And, uh, but basically, very similar. I don't find any great difference in my classes today and my classes that I taught 50 years ago. Now? Now. Okay. My teaching uh, at FIT begins back in 1956 when I was teaching for the New York City Board of Education. I was teaching in the Bronx High School of Science and I was kind of looking for an afternoon or evening job to fill in a little bit. And I was flipping through the yellow pages and I saw an ad by some school called Fashion Institute of Technology. What was the year? My years in FIT started in 1956 when I was teaching for the New York City Board of Education at the Bronx High School of Science. And I was looking for a part-time job, so I was flipping through the yellow pages, and I saw an ad looking for a part-time teacher of science, actually, from some school that I'd never heard of called the Fashion Institute of Technology. So I contacted them and the story begins and continues from this point. I was hired for the job. Um, and uh, one more time, it says from the beginning, it's Keith Lemon from Maine, okay? From the beginning, okay. You know what, Barry, I'll bet you, you just did that three times, and you know it by heart, I'll bet you can do it. That yeah, way. but that's an easy part. <laughs> right. Some of the other stuff yeah. is pretty tough. Right. All right. It's fabulous. All right. Okay. My history at the Fashion Institute of Technology starts in 1956 when I was teaching for the New York City Board of Education at the Bronx High School of Science and I was looking for a part-time job to fill in somewhat. was flipping through the yellow pages when I saw an ad by a school called the Fashion Institute of Technology. Never heard of it, but they wanted what I wanted so I called them up. They offered me an afternoon job teaching science and all mathematics, and I accepted. Now, the FIT of 1956 was quite different from the FIT of today. First place, there was no C building. There were none of these buildings existed. Uh, the whole FIT was in the High School of Fashion Industries, which was on 24th Street. We had, I remember, the entire eighth floor. That was FIT. Uh, our office was a small little narrow room. In fact, it was so narrow that if someone wanted to get by me, I had to stand up and move my chair for them to get by. Now, there were about 200 students, not even, at the school, and there were about a dozen faculty members. FIT itself, by the way, uh, began in 1944, but this was a little bit after that. Uh, our cafeteria, by the way, we had one table in the uh, high school cafeteria. One table was the FIT cafeteria. And we had less than, I, I think I said that, I'm sorry. I guess you can take out anything that's messed up, huh? Yes, this is what I'm going to do. Um, everybody who wants to, I want to start from now. Everything up to this point when you start talking about the cafeteria is, is tremendous, okay? Because it's really something, you know. And then what I want to do now is take a look at that little portion right there. Yeah, okay. Get yourself familiar with it, and then we're going to sit up, talk for a minute, and just give the rest of that Okay. Part. And that's kind of how we'll do it. We'll sort of tell the story like that. Okay. All right? Okay. Okay. And if you don't mind, maybe I might stop you in the middle as we just to go up here with a question at the end of each section. You want to ask me a question? Sure. Okay. I'm ready. Okay. okay. At that time... With all of 200 students, there were three majors. There was one major in fashion buying and merchandising, one major in apparel design, and one major in what they called management. The names are a little different today, but that doesn't make a great difference. The 
school was um, founded by a special law of the state legislature in New York. It was the only college that had its own board of trustees that managed the school. No other school has ever had that in New York State. Uh, the school itself was supported one-third by the city of New York, one-third by the state of New York, and one-third by tuition, which, by the way, in those days was about $300 a year. Okay. Okay, that's basically about that area. Can I ask a couple questions? Yeah, sure. Let me see if I... Um, all right, it's good enough. Okay, yeah. So you said there were 200 students? Less than 200. And it's 40 students here or 25? Uh, the students in those days came primarily from New York City. We had no dormitories. We had that one floor, and uh, there were some students maybe from New Jersey. There were no, almost no students from out of the country or out of the state. Some, but not many. Brooklyn. And how did you get here? What did you get? Just give me your morning, how you got to, to work. What did you get? Um, our classes began at 9 o'clock. Um, I would get up and get ready myself, and I would leave pretty much uh, about 7.30 in the morning in order. I used to have a rule that I would tell the students no lateness, not that it helped. But therefore, if I told them they couldn't be late, I couldn't be late. So I must say I was never late from class. I was never absent from class. And um, then I had, in those days, I'm going to repeat, uh, I'm not, am I on? No. Yeah, keep going. Oh, okay. In those days, um, our class load was uh, 15 hours for liberal arts and 18 hours for lab courses. And now I'm mixed up because I'm not on this, but. That's all right. Just give me that. Keep going. Since you're doing a great. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. <laughs> yeah, all right. I was then going to go on to talk about we'll some. Back to the show. What? We'll go back to the show. All right. Um, Barry, can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, I'm going to give you an answer. Go ahead, ask. When, when you mentioned uh, the liberal arts, can you give us an idea of what offerings were available? Absolutely. In fact, I'm coming arts? to that a little bit. I can what? tell you now and tell sure. you again later. Sure. No. Uh, every student who was going to get an associate degree from FIT uh, had to take 24 credits in liberal arts. The 24 credits were three in the sciences, uh, six in the sciences, six in English, six in social sciences, which is 18, and then six in fine arts, um, history and so forth. That made 24. They had no choice of any kind. They were handed their program, this was your 24 credits, and um, that's it. Then they took their uh, major courses, whichever one of the three majors they were in. We gave them a program. They had no selection of any kind of when they would go to school and what they would go to school, and the faculty members were the same thing. The faculty members had no choice of program. They were given 15 hours of teaching or 18 at labs. They were handed a program, and um, that's it. There's no such thing as saying, I won't teach on Wednesday. You taught on Wednesday. You taught five days a week. Nobody could teach less than five days a week. Do you have any idea how many faculty members there were? About a dozen. Twelve? I, okay. Eleven, fifteen, but about twelve, yes. Could you say that to us again? You're putting me on ice. There were how many... There were, or there were about 12 faculty members. It could be give or take one or two. And as I said, 200 students in these three different majors. How much did a faculty member make a year? I was going to come. Okay. <laughs> faculty member in those days was paid by the New York City Board of Education, the New York City Board of Education salary, and a full-time faculty member made $4,000. A year? A year. And that was considered in those days, don't forget, was over 50 years ago. In those days was considered a pretty good salary. And um, look at what today is. And um, 
that was it. The faculty members program was, uh, the chairman in those days were appointed by the um, president and the chairman would hire someone to teach physical science, for example. He would say, you're going to teach section one, two, five, and seven, and here's your program. You don't like it? There's the door. Now, this was in 1956, right? Yes. And 56, 57. I was part-time in 56. And how long was that before the founding of the union? I don't have an exact date, but I would guess it was maybe 15, 20 years. Before the union? Uh, yeah, the union didn't come right away. The union first came when we moved into the C building and even then a bit. I have those dates, which I'll give you later, but um, there was, like I say, there was no, nothing to choose, not, no choice of any kind, and uh, nor for faculty, not for students. And actually, go ahead. It's okay, go ahead. question for you before you do that, and we'll get back to the Yeah, okay. the difference between student center and student center? Um, the difference between students then and students now frankly was not great. They were, I always said they were sweet, likable, nice kids, and um, today there are many more uh, students from outside the state, from outside the country. We have dormitory students, which we didn't have in those days, and, uh, but basically, very similar. I don't find any great difference in my classes today and my classes that I taught 50 years ago. So you don't find any difference in terms of a work ethic or anything? Like no, that? not really, not really. If it is, it's not major. Do any students stand out in your mind over the years? If you don't ask me their names, yes. There were lots of students who were something special, and one of the things I will mention later on, I always prided myself. There's one question there that asks, what do you prize most, or something like that, and it was that, that my relationship with the students was, was, I was known throughout the school as someone who just got a well along with the students very happily, and the students were happy, and they would come into my class, and they would say, we are going to hate this science class. There is no way we're going to like science. The chip was on this shoulder and one on that shoulder. And then after a little bit, the student, someone would say to me, you know, I can't believe I'm loving this class. And um, I have, a, which I will again relate it to, with some letters from some of the students just saying just those things and telling me some to my dean, some to the president, some to me, mostly to me. Why, well, just hundreds of those letters that uh, talk about the, my relationship between the students, which is one thing that I really prided myself on over the years, the ability to walk into a classroom and get the students right here, and they were very happy. Okay. Uh, let me see, we did that. I told you about the majors, I told you about the pay. Um, Okay, maybe I should start, just finish that last part I was talking about, that the school was under the uh, special laws, I mentioned that there was no school like it that had its own board of trustees, and um, both the city and state contributed to the school, but they did it through our board of trustees, and that was the first school that was able to do that. And we also had something called a foundation, which of course we still have, which in those days just helped out by giving the school, raising money for the school, which they still do, and um, helping out in ways that um, the money didn't come from the city and state. Now, um, some moments of change that um, The school itself was founded in 1944 by a special law of the state legislature of New York. In 1951, a law was passed letting the school grant the associate degree. In 1958, we first laid the cornerstone of the C building. In 1959, 
we entered the C building, there was a parade, there was bands, there was all the students and all the faculties, it was quite a day. That particular day? Well, I pretty much told you all I remember that um, when we were ready to move into the C building out of this crowded little floor and the, um, we and all 200 students, as I say, there was a band and there was the governor was there and the mayor was there and uh, all kind of big shots from all over the city and state because it was such an unusual situation. And we opened up this C building and uh, it was just amazing. Walk, imagine walking from one floor of a high school building into this big, tremendous, tremendous C building. And we were sure that this building would last us for years and years and we would never have a problem. Literally, the day we walked in, we had so many applications that the building was too small. And immediately, we started out to lay plans for a, um, more buildings. And I was doing uh, programming in those days. And uh, one of the jobs that the president of the school asked me to do was to determine how many classrooms we would need for, I forget now the figure, I think for 5,000 students. How many classrooms, what kind of classrooms, how big will the classrooms be? I didn't do any architectural work, but I did all the layout in terms of how many cafeteria we needed. We needed a swimming pool and um, all the things that we needed, that was my job. How many classrooms and what was in the classrooms and so forth and so on. And of course, we ran into a little trouble, which uh, I won't blame the architects, but um, I had Figured, uh, I forget, a certain number of classrooms. And the architects decided, maybe with the chairman, I don't know, that we needed some big classrooms. So what they would do was, they, oh, it was the other way, I'm sorry, that we had projected a certain number of big classrooms and they decided they didn't want these big classrooms. So they would take a classroom that should hold, let's say, 60 students, and they replaced it by a classroom. One for one, right? Except this classroom held 30 students and that held 60. So when we moved into the eventually the B building and the other buildings, you know if you walk down the B corridor, you see all those little holes in the wall that are called classrooms? That's because we were short so many classrooms because of the wonderful work of the architects. So what yes. What happened to the swimming pool? <laughs> <laughs> what happened to the swimming pool was, um, when the president was approving the plans and um, he looked at the swimming pool, in those days money, that, that we had run way, way over um, the amount of money that was funded for the school. So he said, no swimming pool, he put an X with the swimming pool. We were supposed to have under the, uh, all the buildings from 7th to 8th Avenue, we were supposed to build a big parking lot underground for which all the students and faculty could park there for $15 a month. And um, everyone was looking forward to that and of course he took that out. And maybe the funny thing was that after we moved into these buildings, I'm getting way ahead of myself, um, in the in the B building, no, the A building, uh, there was a gym and um, it flooded. And the state and city, the state, they send in people, they f broke down the whole floor, broke down the walls, rebuilt the whole gym. It flooded. Did it again. Happened about four times. We didn't use it for a whole year as they keep breaking it down and rebuilding it and sealing and everything. Finally, some smart architect said, Do you know? We have a river on each side of, the, of this city, and there are riverlets running from one side to the other. Well, FIT is built right on one of those riverlets. Mm -hmm. So in essence, they had to divert that riverlet around the building so we don't have that imitation swimming pool. But we really did have a real swimming pool in the original plans.
side too. Like, if you just start looking, you know, the little sections on the side over there, on the side of the vision, that's everything between A and B. Yeah. That's what was added. Right. But it w between A and B, there was a big hall, but it was a big, wide hall. Mm -hmm. And then they had to add dozens of classrooms. So anywhere you see a little classroom with no windows and nothing, that's why. Okay, shall I continue now again? Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead. Um, why did you, did you intend to stay at SIP when you first began, and how did you come about? Did, did you okay. Um, let me come back to that in a little bit, okay? So I'll finish what this thing I was in the middle of, and then I'll come back to that. In fact, I was going to talk about it. So in 1969, we, the groundbreaking of the... B building then, for which, as I said, I developed the plans, type of classrooms, number of classrooms, met with our board, the architects, met with the state and city legislature and architects to get approval for all the things that we wanted to do. In 1976, the B building opened, and then gradually the rest of our plant was opened and developed, uh, which includes the buildings we have today and the dormitory. In 1975, we were granted by state legislature the ability to have a BA of Fine Arts and a BA of Science. And then in 1979, we were um, granted the permission to open a MA, which we first did in 1985. Now, some of the other things that occurred over the years, follow my own career to a certain extent, and I thought maybe I would just run through that kind of quickly before I go back to those things. I graduated from Yeshiva University in 1951, summa cum laude, from 53, Columbia University in MA, 56, Columbia University, a professional diploma, supervisor of mathematics, in 61, a PhD from Columbia. In 56, I came to FIT part-time. I enjoyed as students and faculty so much that I was debating what to do, and then I was offered a job full-time after being here one semester part-time by the administration, by the science department. And, you know, in those days, I don't know if you know there was such a time, but there were absolutely no math teachers in the city of New York. You could take any job you wanted. I could have got any one of 50 different jobs because there was such a shortage of math and science teachers. So <laughs> FIT, in order to entice me, number one offered me one. I could have the salary the Board of Education uh, offered me. I said, I can get more. Fine, we'll give you an additional 25%. And um, which will come from the foundation. So when I did accept it, I was, I used to get two checks every month, one from the Board of Education and one from the Foundation for an additional actually thousand dollars. And they said to me, um, you're still not sure? I said, well, you know what? Teach for us one year full time. If we like you and you like us, you have tenure at the end of one year. So, um, okay, I said fine. So I took the job. I've been happy ever since, and I was never sorry. There was chance for improvement and chance to do things, and so was my life at FIT. That sounds great. Did you do your finger math? Because that, I mean, that story is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Would you just uh, extemporaneously, extempore do it extemporaneously, or would you go very virtual? And how, just up to that, how you, where you stood on that direction, you know? Why I stayed here and so forth? Oh, okay, about me. All right. I grew up in, born and grew up in Portland, Maine, and um, I lived there till college, actually, when I graduated in Portland, Maine from high school, where I won't list them all, but I received a couple of awards. Um, I then came to New York City. I went to Yeshiva University where I received my um, BA. Then I went to Columbia University where I received my MA and my doctorate. And uh, I was married in the early 50s. 
And I now have, uh, besides my wife, three children and four, eight grandchildren, nine, ten grandchildren. And um, of course, I will say they're all the sweetest little dolls. But okay, some of them aren't little dolls anymore. My oldest is 59, and my youngest is two. So um, then, of course, I, as I say, I was looking through the papers, and I found this job at FIT, and uh, I was happy here, and I stayed here. Sure. Um, there was not. There really wasn't a great difference. We lived in Brooklyn. Brooklyn is a place of trees and private streets. And we, when we first got married, had a uh, small apartment in Brighton Beach. And then we looked around and found a home in Brooklyn on East 7th Street near Avenue J, which is off of Ocean Parkway, which has, you know, it's a major, one of the major sections in Brooklyn. And um, we've been happy there ever since. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't feel any great difference today than I felt um, when I first moved in there. Although the people who were my neighbors, and um, I guess the woman who was my next door neighbor must have easily been, I don't know, 30 years older than I, or 40 years maybe. She was telling me how when she moved to Brooklyn, um, there were no streets. There were nothing. Just everything was um, not even lawns, pastures and so forth. There were animals all over. And uh, gradually streets were built. Her father built the house that she was living in, which is still the house that is next door to me. And now, of course, everything is trees and so forth. But people-wise, and the subways, of course, were still there when I came. There are no new subways since I came here. All the subways that are now are there. And the only thing, of course, is traffic is much worse than it was then. And uh, beyond that, uh, there's really no great difference. You wouldn't notice the change in years. And uh, Yes? Well, not Midwest, from Maine. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. yeah. But it's okay. Yeah, I'll tell you what, what did. Um, my family is um, a religious Orthodox family. In Portland, Maine, while there were 5,000 Jewish people in the city, they were mostly conservative and reform. There were about 100,000 people in the whole city. There were really very few Orthodox people. There was no chance for real Orthodox upbringing. Uh, not so much upbringing, because that you can do internally in a home. But there were no schools. There, were no, there was what they called Talmud Torah. It's an uh, elementary school uh, where you went to high school and went there after school a little bit. But you had no real training. The only place where you could get real training in, in real Jewish education was to come to New York. And Yeshiva University, since I was ready to go to college at that time, um, was where I came and where I went to. And that was my main reason for coming to New York. And again, uh, I went there and got a very strict Jewish education, a very uh, full Jewish education. And as you know, I'm Orthodox to this day. What was your major at Yeshiva? Math. And minor was science. So I was perfectly able to teach um, both math and science um, here. Columbia, I went to just because I wanted a doctorate. And uh, I guess at that time, I wasn't really thinking of um, coming to FIT, although we try over the years to get people with doctorates, but I was really thinking of probably doing some college teaching in math and or science, and um, doctorate was necessary. So uh, I, I did that. In fact. Yeshiva University, well, this is kind of offside, um, leads eventually to a rabbinate to become a rabbi and teach you know, in, a, in a synagogue or in a school or whatever. 
And while I was majoring in math, I was in that program as well. And but then I was doing that, and I was doing uh, my work at uh, the Columbia. And it came to the point where I said to myself, "Now look, you want to be a rabbi or you want to be a doctorate?" I said, "Doctorate." So I dropped that program and I uh, left Yeshiva University. I mean, well after I graduated. In fact, uh, when I was in the, even my senior in, F in Yeshiva University, I was offered a job teaching math in the college, what I hadn't even graduated yet. And, um, but then I went on to Columbia because I thought that would be my field, teaching math and science in a university. And because of coming to FIT and being so happy at FIT, I got my doctorate, but I stayed at FIT. What about the community here at FIT? I keep hearing from people who have been here longer than me that something has been lost or changed. Yeah, well, again, that was one of the questions, but okay. Um, when I came to FIT and for quite a few years afterwards, it was a um, very close-knit community. Uh, there wasn't one faculty member that I didn't know by name, and especially since I did the college program, and they all knew me by name. Uh, the student body, all 200, I would say I knew just about every one of them. And since only I and a gentleman named William Leader taught the only science courses, then every student that was required to take science was either in my class or his. Now, since the two courses, one was physical science and one was biological science, he primarily taught the biological science and I taught the physical science. So I really just about taught every student in the school. And um, so we knew every student. So the community was a very close-knit community. We were all the best of friends. We all knew each other. We went to each other's homes. And uh, in fact, a funny thing, in those days, if you go way back then, um, the vacation time was different. You used to go to school up until Christmas vacation and that was not final exam time. We started school after Labor Day. And when we came up to Christmas time, we had a two week vacation where students went home. And as more and more students came to the school and more and more students uh, had a problem going home for Christmas time and then coming back to FIT for their final exams and besides to kill their vacation, um, this college, as we got more and more students from outside, um, eventually started school before Labor Day and ended up at the Christmas vacation. And of course, many students would complain. I remember my students bitterly complaining. Um, we have to start before Labor Day, and they were so upset. When I explained to them the choice, I said, fine, you want to start before Labor Day or you want to have come back after Christmas vacation for finals? Oh, we'll start before Labor Day, no question. So they weren't so upset anymore. But, you know, we were so close with the students. There used to be a hotel up in the Catskills, which doesn't exist anymore, called Grossinger's. You know Grossinger's? Fine. Okay. Before the kids went off to Christmas vacation, those students who didn't get home too early we arranged with Grossingers, which wasn't filled before Christmas or before New Year's, they were kind of empty, to come up there with about, oh, I don't know, maybe a hundred students and uh, half a dozen faculty members as chaperones. And um, the kids would go up for three days, two nights, three meals a day, ice skating, skiing, you name it. You know what they paid? $25. Faculty went free, and um, I still remember we used to have to do bed check, and um, we used to walk around through the halls and knock on each door, and they would say, wait till we get dressed, and of course, then they would get in bed and cover up to their heads, and they had to be in bed by a certain time. So that was quite a community, quite a close group, and over the years, it's changed. I mean, now, okay, I'm retired, and that's one reason, but... I was telling you the other day, we walked through the hall, and she was saying hello to people. I don't know them anymore. I don't know anybody anymore. I know a few people in our office, and as I said, I used to walk through the halls and knew everybody. No more. So the community has changed from a very happy, 
close-knit community to, I don't say it's not happy today, but it's not close-knit. We're no longer in little classrooms. We're spread all over five or six buildings, so it is five, ten, fifteen thousand students. So you can't say the community is the same. It's far different. Yeah. Um, Sarah, when you first started here, were there social clubs for individual groups? For example, was there an Italian American club, or was there a Jewish cultural club for the students? Um, there were some clubs, but not too many. And most of those were just by some teacher saying, you know, we should have this kind of a club. Maybe we had a few clubs. Not many. Not many. Do you remember what some of them were? No. No. Yeah, I remember one, because I ran it, the photography club. Oh. <laughs> the others I don't remember. Were you still a Jewish club? Yeah. Not so much anymore, but years ago I was... Uh, had my own dark room and everything, but those those days uh, of the box camera, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when did they take photography here? Um, I I couldn't give you a date, but of course at one point we did start a photography major, and um, I was not involved in any way in it. And was that about the idea of the school? Yeah. How did the union come about? What was the reason for the union coming about? <sighs> How did the union come about? All right, when um, we were at FIT, uh, way back when, about in the C building already, so we're now talking about, uh, I don't know, 100 faculty members, maybe more, several thousand students. There were no rights, there were no privileges. You were assigned a program, you taught five days a week, there was no way you could get a four-day program. And if you wanted the day off, the dean would say no. You're here five days a week. And um, if your program worked out, that I, for example, did the scheduling, I could not schedule them on five days because of the requirements the department wanted them to teach this course in this class, fine. You can teach four days, but on the fifth day, you have office hours. Nobody could not come in five days a week. Of course, eventually that changed, as you know, to finally she gave in and she allowed four days a week. Then eventually, with under great duress, three days, but those are the union already, three days a week. So there were no benefits really of any kind. Um, you didn't have, we had some, actually I take it back, we did have some benefits. What benefits do we have? The Board of Education benefits. Whatever they gave their members, we got. But that's it. So when we formed the union, which, and I don't remember the date, I'm sorry, I knew that's the next question, I don't remember. Um, myself, Lou Stoller, Mike Silverstein, uh, people who are on those pictures, got together and we formed this group called the Union, UCE, and um, we began to deal with the administration. Of course, they were not too interested in the beginning, but as we got more and more members who wanted to belong to this union. We also included just, well, not really just, but it gave us more strength because we had all the staff included because we had agreed that they should have benefits just the way we should have benefits, not necessarily 100% the same. But you look around, what staff and what place has the benefits our staff has? Nobody. So anyways, um, in order to... Um, get some benefits, the union then formed, met with the administration, and from these no benefits, we began to get all kinds of benefits. You only have to look at the contract to see what the union accomplished. And um, the people, we had the executive committee, of which I was a member actually since its, since its inception, throughout the day I retired, and even for a few years afterwards. And we have accomplished many, many things. So, talk about Lou Stola. Was, was he the first president of the Lou Stola was actually the first president, and he was president for many, many, many years until he designed to retire, decided to retire. And we now have a president, um, what's her name? I forget. Juliet. Juliet, of course. I know her so well, but I don't, I don't ever remember names. And she is the second president, and that's, that was it. 
for all these years, or certainly 30 years and more. And uh, he was president by acclamation from day one until the day he decided to retire. And then he stayed on as president for a while and then decided to leave, and that's it. We're in a tough time right now. Were there other tough times that the union helped people through? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. There were times when um, we had lots of problems, and during those days they would make agreements with the administration that we will take some whatever, uh, losses and so forth, if you guarantee us, that was one guarantee, number one, no loss of faculty or staff. And they agreed, as long as we were able to meet our obligations, and the union did it. And uh, they, there was one particular period, I forget exactly when it was, when times were very, well, you remember, times were very tough here in the city at one point, and we got, yeah, and we got a state uh, that began to take control of certain parts of the city and so forth. Well, those were the days. And today things are maybe tougher. But, uh, what about the president's house, too? Do you remember that book? I do remember uh, there was one was named Feldman, one was named Jarvi, and um, I don't remember all the names, but they are all on there. What else can I answer? Or do you want me to go back to that? Uh, Is there anything on there that we missed? Do you guys want to talk about anything else that we have here? No, there's lots of more I questions. Have, I have a question. For go you. ahead. Just in terms of the material, um, this more than likely people, when they're watching this, they just lumped it all together. They're going to be watching it either over the internet or on a DVD player, some place on a big screen TV, something like that. I know there was always a media department here when you moved things in the classroom. There was always what? I don't think I used, the only audiovisual that I really used in my classroom way back when was I used to always use an overhead projector because uh, I was allergic to chalk. So I used, and besides, that wasn't even the real reason. I think the most important reason that I used that overhead projector was because I don't like to teach facing the blackboard. I like to teach facing you people like right now. And if I would teach something and you didn't understand me, I would see it in your face. And if you needed help, I would give it to you. If something, I could see if things would bother the class. And uh, we got along much better that way. And of course, in the science class, I used lots of equipment that um, showed them different experiments and so forth. But as far as um, other mechanical things, uh, I think my class has changed over the years because uh, as um, things advanced in the world of science and the world of mathematics, I think I had to make sure my class changed with it so that the students in those days and these days would know the things they have to know in the world in which they live because they are living, especially today, in a scientific world like never before. Do I use one personally, you mean? Mm -hmm. um, yes. Am I fantastic? No. My grandson can do 10 times what I can do. Of course, he happens to be exceptionally good with a computer. He's had many jobs in which he um, worked for companies where he took care of their computers. But um, any problem I have, I just call him up. But yes, I can use a computer and so forth and so on. Not some of the things he can do, but some of them. Yeah, I certainly knew. I knew everybody. I knew everybody. Everybody knew me. Sure, I knew Al. Tell me a little bit about Al, because he's the guy who hired you here. Tell you about him? Ah, he, was, he was a nice guy. If you wanted something, he was happy to do it for you. And anything I did want, he would bring it right away to class. And he was just, he was just a good friend, good guy. So, um, you see that telephone over there in the corner? That's his telephone. I believe it. I remember using phones like that. Want to go back to your notes? Want to tell if you notes? want. I mean, I've said an awful lot of them, but I can go through some of them and see if I missed anything. Go ahead. 
Go ahead. Well, there's this thing called the Seagull Clan here at FIT. Do you know anything about that? No. Okay. No, but I did. Designed to make FIT a, a international university. No, I sort of started out know there. nothing about it. There was one day when there was nothing that I didn't know here. I was involved in every solitary thing, but those days are gone. What do you think about the idea of FIT as an international university as a place you would have started out at? Why not? I don't object to it if, if they can handle it. I don't know. We have, as you know, schools in several areas outside the country, and um, so it's a beginning if you want. Where what? We're going to start offering minor in the liberal arts. That's also something new, right? Mm -hmm. Right, right. So somebody can have ma minor maybe in finance and law. That would be interesting because I have had students that ended a semester with me who've come up to me and say, you know something, you know what you did to me? I said, what? What did I do to you? She, she or he would say, I came here, I was interested in merchandising, interested in design. I took your science class. I'm leaving and going to be a science major. And more than once, more than once, more than once. But right, anyways, let me just quickly, you can use this or not use it. I'll tell you some of the things that I did over the years, which may tell you some things that you might want to know. Going back to 58, I would just hear a little bit. I developed what was called a HIP program. Faculties had no real medical. And then when that we weren't happy with that, we developed a major medical, which is the one we had for many, many years. Our me medical benefits were so far above every other school in the city and state that it's unbelievable. For 63 to 70, I was director of admissions, which included programming of classes, scheduling, Oh, this is interesting. Everything was a block program, as I mentioned. Uh, if you were a merchandising student, the merchandising department decided on what classes you were going to take. You decided nothing. You were handed the day you walked in, here is your block program. That's it. And the faculty members, as I mentioned, also got a block program. Everything was assigned. Uh, our computer, since you asked me about computers, our computer in those days, when we did the um, scheduling of classes and then the scheduling of students, it was done in the um, big gym. Students would come in, and they would say, I don't know why they even bothered, because it was a block program, but they did. They would come in and say, I'm going to take science, whatever. So we would have a, cl a set of 35 little cards, which said science 11, 317. And as a student would ask for it, we'd hand it out. And then they'd register, and we had a, a, like a file cabinet well, with little boxes on it, and we'd put all the classes for that in here. And when the cards were gone, the class was closed. That was our computer. Okay? <laughs> um, 35 students were in a class in those days. Uh, labs were a little bit less. Um, let me see. On the right hand, told you that. Gradually, I was asked to develop some individual programming, which I did. And um, students got some choice. Faculty members got some choice. Not too much, but some. I was then approached to take off the job of assistant dean, which in those days was something like the vice president of academic affairs. I was offered the job of vice president of the college, which I turned down for certain personal reasons, which made certain administrative people extremely angry. Uh, I developed all the math programs, Math 11, 12, and all the remedial programs. Uh, in 58, I developed, as I mentioned, a remedial math program, especially for fashion buying students and a testing program for them. The ones that passed the test didn't take the remedial course. The ones that failed, it did. And we still have something like that today. Then a math course and remedial program for the management students. And, um, oh, this you should like. In 1960, a group of faculty, of which I was headed at the time, 
developed the plan for a faculty association for which I wrote the bylaws, was the first chairman, and actually served, I actually counted them once, in every single committee that was in the um, faculty association. Tenure promotion, personal policy, student affairs, curriculum, and so forth. In 1964, I developed what was called the PM program. Now, this is something I don't think too many people know about, but the PM program meant the following. We were swamped. We were turning away students like crazy. So we took some students that we had to turn away, and we said to them, I think about a, a hundred maybe, we will let you come to a summer session. We didn't have a summer session in those days, but we'll have a special PM summer session where you will take about half of, let's say, merchandising, half of the merchandising program. If you're successful, comes the fall semester, we will let you take the other half of your program at night. Then you've completed a semester. Now, in the second semester, lots of, not lots, but some students always drop out. So we used to have spaces. So these students who had successfully completed the so-called PM program, PM afternoon program, would then slide into these places. So with this, we were able to take an additional 100 or more students that we couldn't take before. Shortly after that, um, I developed a summer program, which we didn't have, and I directed this summer program for quite a few years. We had the only building then was the C building when we started the summer session, and um, we had no air conditioning, so it was kind of um, hot. We put four temporary classrooms in the back during the year we needed them, and then in summer session we had four air-conditioned classrooms, but we had dozens of classes, so we didn't have enough. So you can imagine the quarreling or fighting or whatever of student, uh, faculty and students trying to get into those particular classes that were air conditioned. There wasn't much. It's a funny thing. When we built the C building, I remember in those days talking to the, um, uh, the president and the uh, governor and so forth about air conditioning the C building. And the president and governor both said no, it was too expensive because also the city administrative said, we don't air condition school buildings in the city of New York. You don't do it, therefore you can't do it. So I remember one of our trustees, a very nice gentleman called Half, uh, he said, um, look, don't air condition it, but put in the ducts. It'll cost you $10,000. We don't air condition school buildings in the city of New York. He said, look, it costs $10,000. I'll pay for it. We don't air condition school buildings in the city of New York. Can you imagine? When we built the A building and the B building and air conditioned them, how can you not have an air conditioned C building? Cost the school over a million dollars to run the air conditioning through the C building. Hmm? That's, that's the way it goes. So. Anyway, okay, I'm almost finished anyways. Thank you, Bob. You're very welcome. Okay. You, um, when I was just saying things in general, you got that all down. Right? So I don't have to repeat whatever was, okay. Okay, then I got most, but I'll just tell you a little bit more. Okay. I'm almost finished. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you are very welcome. See you next week. Okay, um, in 1965, I headed the committee for the first Middle States evaluation and wrote the report for it and again later on for the second evaluation and from then on someone else did it. I told you about, what was that I told you about? Liberal arts I told you about. I told you why this question was 
why did I decide to stay? Because I liked the programs, the students and faculty. Just seemed like an ideal place to be and much chance of advancement. Community we talked about. <laughs> did I lose anything over the years? Yes, the closeness of faculty, the relationship with students, like a family. What? Okay, um, I think I really did before, but basically, um, as I say, uh, the fa faculty was very close to each other. We got together a lot. We all knew each other. We were friends. You knew everybody, and we don't have that anymore. That's gone. I mean, you have some friends in the faculty, sure, but now we have, I don't know how many hundreds of faculty, and you can't be friends with them all. I walk through the hall today and I don't recognize any faces. I look through a list of faculty doing this and that, I don't know them. In the days years ago, I could look through any list of faculty. I knew everyone and we were all buddy-buddy. And uh, same thing with the students. So those things have changed. Oh, some things that I really remember in my career here at FIT um, as I mentioned before, but doesn't hurt to repeat, I was a registrar, assistant dean. I was the first chairman to be elected. Up before that point, every chairman was appointed by the president of the college. No chairman was elected. I was the first one who was ever broke through and we actually elected chairman. Now, of course, all chairmen are elected. Uh, when I retired, I was the most senior faculty member at FIT. And I always said, it was a, there was a list of faculty. As my name moved up and up, I always said, I don't retire until I get on the top. When I got on the top, just coincidentally, I did retire. Um, another thing which I'm kind of, two more things which I'm kind of proud of. One, there were no full professors in the college over the years except for those people who were college chairmen. The chairmen, when they were appointed by the president, were also given the rank of full professor. I was the first person in the college that was granted the rank of full professor for merit alone. No one before me. After me, yes. Um, after I retired, I was also granted the title of professor emeritus which again, if you look at the catalog, there aren't too many. And something that satisfied me more than anything else, as I mentioned before, is that I feel I have accomplished a lot at FIT, but with my proudest thing is the relationship I had with the students. I think I mentioned this before, that I was able to take these students who knew they were going to hate science and knew they were going to hate math and get them to love it. And they did and they learned. And in fact, I just quickly mention, listen to this. This was written to my chairman in those days, Joe Castelli. As the semester draws to a close, I must take the opportunity to write about Dr. Barry Ginsburg. I was fortunate enough to be placed in his algebra review class this term, and I believe it was one of the best mathematical experiences I ever had. Dr. Ginsburg installed the knowledge and the understanding of algebra in me. All through my high school years, math was always an extremely difficult subject for me. This semester, Dr. Ginsburg opened my eyes to show how easy and fun algebra can be if you only take time to really learn. You maybe want to learn, and that I believe is what really counts. Dr. Ginsburg always devoted class time to thoroughly go over the homework, answer questions, review material, and so forth and so on. But let me just w mention one or two in science. It was a real pleasure having such an interesting and concerned professor as yourself. You made a subject, which I have despised throughout all of my school years, a very interesting one. I enjoyed it. I wish you were teaching biology next semester. Professor, just a note to thank you for helping me learn what I thought was once impossible for me. You are a fine teacher. Not only do you share your great knowledge, your time and patience were greatly appreciated. Well, okay. I can go on and on, but I don't want to take. 
And I think that I is... I have one or two minutes left on here. Do you want to just wrap up and give me like one or two little quick little happy memories? Well, I, I really gave you the happiest memories. The happiest memories that I have had here at FIT is in the student body and the faculty. I think there is nothing like the FIT faculty, even though I don't know most of them today, but over the years when I did, and the students and my classes, and the classroom was for me. That's one of the reasons when I was chairman, I did it for a couple of years. I did all these administrative things for years and years and years, and it got to the point where I said, no, I'm giving up too much teaching. That's where I really, I don't, I, I excel. And I went back to teaching, and I was teaching full time my last years here at FIT, and I, there was nothing like it. Being a teacher is teaching students things that are important for them to know. We're living in a scientific world like never before, and students have to understand how it affects their daily life. Anything that they do has a scientific reason behind it. As I went through a semester, I would not just teach the straightforward material but I would show how each and every one could be used in their life. Things that they did every day, I would explain to them why, how. And this is why I think that the students left my classes being happy with them, and I would always end the semester, as I did today, a semester with everybody just being so close and so friendly. And when you come in the first day, they are so far from you. And um, that first day is so important, though. If you get them the first day, you got them. And um, that's... It sounds to me like you teach them more than just math and science. I try. I try. Well, I, I end up friends. And um, that's life.